Welcome back to the Ninja Nerd Podcast. Today's episode is on acute kidney injury or AKI. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a really good one. I, I think whenever a patient has an acute kidney injury, it's one of those things that if you work in a hospital, uh, you're going to become exposed to this. And it's going to be one of these things where you have to really, really thoroughly work it up. And so I think whenever the kidney is all jacked up, it is really, really important for us to be able to think about this in a very systematic and critical way, which I think we will throughout the process of these cases. Okay. Like all of our content, we have this content available in a whiteboard lecture, digital presentations. We have notes, illustrations. Please check out our website, become a member. We have so much to offer. This is just an additional resource. It's not the end all be all. It's just something else we're trying to offer you to really help have you more of a rounded learning experience. Yeah. If you're doing some dishes, uh, you got some free time and you want to listen to a little bit of uh, interesting information about AKI, go ahead, dive in and enjoy. All right. Well, let's just go ahead and do that then right away. So we have three cases for acute kidney injury. Let's start it off with case one. We have a 72 year old male presents to the ED with confusion and a decreased urine output. The patient is a retired teacher, was initially in his usual state of health until three days ago when he began experiencing fever, chills, and increased fatigue. Given these symptoms, he visited his primary doc, who noted a significant increase in his creatinine from a baseline of 1.6 to 3.2, and recommended that he immediately go to the ED for further evaluation. Over the past 24 hours, his family noticed that he appeared confused and was not making as much urine as he normally would. How do, how do they know that? Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. like watching him in the bathroom. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. <laughs> because if he's confused, he doesn't know how much he's pissing. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> Sorry, I just found that interesting. That is interesting, yeah. Go ahead. We're going to move right past that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His past medical history is uh, pertinent for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and chronic kidney disease stage 2. Okay. Medications is metformin, lisinopril, and hydrochlorothiazide. Let's move right into the exam. So for vitals, we have a BP 90 over 55. All right, maps in the shatter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not good. Nope. Heart rate is 110. Respiratory rate is 22. His temp is 101.3 Ooh, Fahrenheit. You know he did. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> O2 sat is 94% on room air. For just the general exam, he's an elderly male, appears lethargic, disoriented. Cardio, he's tachycardic. Peripheral pulses are weak. Extremities are cool to touch. Respiratory is mild tachypnea. Abdominal, soft, non distended, mild diffuse tenderness. Uh, skin, he has a pupuric rash on the lower extremities. And for the neuro exam, he is alert but disoriented to time and place. So, Zach, based upon all of this information, all of these, these things that are popping out, blood pressure is not doing too good. He's disoriented. How would you go ahead and approach this patient and, and really understand what type of AKI is it and how do we go about talking about that? Yeah, so this is a, a really interesting one. So we, they were nice enough to say that whenever they drew his labs, right, that and, and interestingly, when he came in, he came in with confusion. And it, funny enough, they, they were monitoring his output, it decreased urine output. Okay. Um, but they were able to get some labs and he went from 1.6 to 3.2. So he pretty much doubled his creatinine. Uh, whenever you increase your creatinine, according to what's called the K-Digo, which is like the, the newest kind of criteria, we used to use like the rifle and then there was another one. Uh, that we utilized as well. But I think it's come down to now where we are preferring the k Diego, And it looks at creatinine. And if the creatinine jumps up uh, by greater than or equal to 0 0.3 milligrams per deal in a two-day period, that's considered to be an AKI. Um, another reason is if you were to look at their actual creatinine from prior in the past seven days or the past week, and it jumps to greater than or equal to 1.5 times their baseline, whatever their baseline is, that's almost like a 50% increase. Yeah. Um, that's also concerning for an acute kidney injury. And then the last thing is oliguria. And we define this in a couple of different ways, but the, the guidelines for Kidaigo looks at a urine output to be less than 0 0.5 cc's per kilogram. So half a milliliter per their body weight per hour for greater than or equal to six hours. And so if you look at their body weight, you kind of multiply that by 0.5 or you half that, that's how much urine they should be making theoretically every hour for at least more than six hours. But if they're making less than that, then that's where we're getting a little bit concerned. Okay. Sometimes oligary you can also define as less than 400 to 500 milliliters within a 24 hour period. But right now I see the creatinine concern. They nearly doubled their creatinine. 
that's definitely concerning for an AKI. Which type of AKI? It's a little bit more difficult to kind of suss out right away. I have some thoughts. Um, I think getting a lot of different labs and looking at their history is helpful here. Right off the get-go, I see the blood pressure's low. And yeah. you kind of made point to that. I also kind of made jokes of it that this person's hypotensive. They're also tachycardic and they're febrile. That worries me about potentially like septic shock. Yeah. Um, their abdomen is a little distended and it's diffusely tender. I don't know if they have some type of intra-abdominal infectious process that's going on of sorts, but I'm definitely concerned that they're undergoing some type of infection that's then called them to become septic. And now when they're septic, they're experiencing hypotension. And so I'm starting to think about a pre-renal AKI, um, but I would want to get some labs, maybe even some imaging to make sure that I'm not missing something else like a weird post-renal or intrarenal AKI. But I have a very strong feeling that this is likely pre-renal. All righty. Sorry, I just burnt the crap out of my tongue. <laughs> I it's saw you take a, coffee. take a good hit of that coffee, huh? Dr too, way too much. Dude, back in my day, they made coffee hot. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> my God. <laughs> Gotta take a second. <laughs> wow, that was freaking hot. Anyway, given the presence of an AKI, what labs and imaging would you find to be most pertinent for this patient? So when I see a doubling of the creatinine and a drop off in the urine output, I'm definitely suspecting a AKI. What I would do first... And I don't think that this patient has a lot of risk factors, but oftentimes it's kind of like sacrilege in the hospital to not get a renal bladder ultrasound. The reason why is, is that if there's any AKI that a person could get, it would be post renal because it's just immediately, it's most of the time it's super, super easy to fix. And you just don't want to miss that. Um, so first thing I would do is if I could, I would I do what's called a point of care ultrasound, or I would get a formal ultrasound of the renal and the bladder uh, area. And the reason why I would do that is I'm looking for any evidence of obstruction. So if there's an obstruction at the renal pelvis, the ureter, somewhere within the bladder, at the bladder outlet, I'd be able to likely pick that up. I'd look for hydronephrosis, which is kind of a large distension fluid-filled kidney. Hydroureter is a little bit harder to pick up on the ultrasound. And then I would just run down over the bladder, scan over that, and look to see if that puppy is like super large and distended. So that might be a, a really easy way for you to say, oh, hey, this is post-renal. Let me just exactly knock it off yeah, my differential exactly and we can try and figure out what pre-renal <clears throat> intrarenal exactly okay and so that's the way i would start off get that off the table it's one of the easiest ones if you do find it cool because oftentimes for example let's say that you find hydronephrosis and maybe some hydro ureter and you're like okay is it at the at the renal pelvis or the ureter level or is it at the bladder bladder outlet level oftentimes we can just look at the bladder scan it over if the bladder is like super big and puffy I'm thinking it's probably the bladder and the bladder outlet that's the problem. And those, I'll just do a Foley. So usually if you put a Foley in, they'll start draining urine. Their urine output will improve. Their creatinine will start to kind of drop as well. Uh, just got to be careful with those patients because they can get what's called post-obstructive diuresis and they can get super dehydrated. But that's what I would do. Or another one, if you don't want to put in a Foley and keep it in, sometimes you can kind of undo another thing where you try to have the patient go to the bathroom. And after they go to the bathroom, you scan over their bladder. You look for what's called a post-void residual. Yep. And if that's pretty high, um, that also suggests it's probably at the bladder bladder outlet. But if the bladder is normal size and it's not super big, I would then start considering, could it be like a, a stone somewhere in the ureters? And I may scan the patient's um, abdomen and pelvis to look for like some kind of stone or cancer or some kind of process like that. But this patient, they don't have BPH. They're not on any medications that would cause neurogenic bladder. Um, and I don't see any concerning features here of nephrolithiasis. So... I think that that's unlikely, but I would still get it. Um, right. Second thing I would do <laughs> for clinicians out there, they probably wouldn't like to hear this. It's good for your boards. You get what's called a urine sodium, a urine creatinine, um, a urine osmolality, um, and a urinalysis. I would get those things. The urinalysis, I think, is actually with microscopy is helpful. The urine sodium, the urine creatinine, you're getting that because what you'll do is you look at the urine sodium, the urine creatinine, and look you'll look at their BMP or their renal function, it'll give you their serum sodium and their serum creatinine. And you plug it into an equation called FINA. And the FINA will help us and the boards to look for a patient's likelihood of pre-renal, intrarenal AKI. So for example, if a patient has a FINA less than 1%, that means that the actual kidneys are super heavy in absorbing sodium. So aldosterone is really ele elevated. And then uh, also, uh, the other thing I would notice here is if their urine osmolality is really, really high, it tells me that their ADH is really high and they're reabsorbing water across the kidneys. This is ways that the body's trying to portend to a hypovolemic or poor effective arterial volume state. Um, and so that would lend to me the pre-renal AKI. So if the phenol is less than 1%, 
or the urine osmolality is pretty high, greater than 500, I'm thinking it could be pre-renal. Problem is, is that this test kind of falls off because patients can have a phenol less than 1% and still have an intrarenal AKI. So I oftentimes like to say if the phenol is less than 1%, it could be any AKI. If the phenol is greater than 2% um, or the urine osmolality is less than 350, that oftentimes more than not does suggest that the tubules are not responding to ADH and aldosterone. And that would tell me it's most likely ATN. So if the phenol is greater than 2%, you do for the most part rule out pre-renal and it's likely ATN. It's not guaranteed, but if the phenol is less than 1%, it could be any type of AKI. And so it's not a perfect system. So that's the first thing I would do. So phenol is less than 1% in the textbooks, urine osmolality is pretty high. It's possibly a pre-renal. If it's greater than 2% and the urine osmolality is low, less than 350, it's likely ATN. What I like to do though, if for this scenario, is I like to also look at the patient's volume status and look at their history after I've gotten this phena and the urine osmolality. If I look at their volume status and they look super hypovolemic, all right, and then they've had a history of diarrhea, uh, vomiting, dehydration, blood loss, it's probably hypovolemia. If I look at um, their history and they have a really bad history of heart failure, I'm thinking about a disease called cardiorenal syndrome, especially if they're hypervolemic and swollen, they have edema in their lungs and in their legs. Um, if they have cirrhosis and they have ascites, I'm concerned about what's called hepatorenal syndrome. And so this can also be potential thoughts. So if I see hypervolemia or evidence of that, look for history of cirrhosis, HRS, history of CHF, CRS. Lastly, if the patient is hypotensive beyond all heck, which this patient kind of is, I'd be worried about shock. Septic shock is a really big one, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, any kind of shock really. And then lastly, look for medications. So medications, especially if they're kind of not hypo or hypervolemic, look for ACE inhibitors, ARBs, NSAIDs, and even tacro and cyclosporin. So those, those are the kind of the ways that I would look at that is I would look at their history and look at those things. Next, let's go back and let's say that the phenol is greater than 2% or the urine osmolality is less than 350. It does suggest possibly an intrarenal AKI, most likely ATM. What I would do is look at the urinalysis with microscopy. If the urinalysis shows what's called muddy brown casts or granular casts, it most likely suggests ATN. And then you just have to go thinking about what's the likely cause of their ATN. Have they had any recent prolonged period of hypotension? Have they had any kind of rhabdo, tumor lysis syndrome? Have they been exposed to drugs like vancomycin or cisplatin or aminoglycosides or contrast dye? Do they have multiple myeloma? That's when you want to think about those. If, and this is, I hate this test, but if patients have what's called white blood cell cast and they have what's called urine eosinophils and a lot of them, you think about AIN. However, that test is so low in specificity and sensitivity that it doesn't mean anything, but on the boards, it's like a 99% predictive value for some reason. So uh, think about that for your boards in clinical reality. Don't even order the test. It's a waste of time. But what we think about for AIN is think about the triad. So think about uh, exposure to some type of medication recently, like an antibiotic. And then on top of that, they develop fever, rash, and then they have eosinophils in their blood and eosinophils in their urine. You can think about that. Lastly, if they have like blood in their urine and protein in their urine, and you look under the microscope and it shows what's called red blood cell casts, then I would start thinking about some type of glomerulonephritis. So that's the way I would do this is I would get renal ultrasound, bladder ultrasound, urine sodium, urine creatinine, urine osmolality, a urinalysis with microscopy, but also look at their history physical, and volume status. All right, well, buckle up because we got about a million lab tests to go through. <laughs> we it, It's very thorough, though, so I can't I can't fault you on that one. Yeah, you got to, sometimes you don't want to miss something, you know? You no, no, let's be thorough. All right, so we do get that phenol level back at 0.8%. Okay. Urine osmolality, 520. Protein is trace amounts. A red blood cell, 2.3 per high power field. White blood cell, 1 to 2 per high power field. Uh, we have presence of hyaline casts. Creatinine is 3.2. It was originally that baseline of 1.6. BUN is 60. Potassium is 6.2. So we're over there. Mm -hmm. We get an ABG back. pH is 7.31. Bicarb is 14. And a PCO2 is 26. Sodium, 135. We get a, a full total white blood count, 18,000. Yikes. That's All not right. good. That's, bueno there. that's the... Red flag. Yep. Hemoglobin, 10.8, and a platelet count of 250,000. We do get the imaging findings back, like Zach said. We do a renal and a bladder ultrasound. 
Let's just try and quickly rule out those post-renal causes. Kidneys show normal size, no, no signs of hydronephrosis, stones, or masses. Bladder is normal in contour without thickening or mass. All right, so all good there. So Zach, given the HMP, given these labs, imaging, that scary white count that we just talked about, yeah. what is your likely diagnosis? Yeah, so if we kind of go back through our, our systematic approach here, check the renal bladder ultrasound. As you said, no, no evidence of obstruction. So I put post-renal AKI off the table. Uh, next thing, look to see what the urine sodium and the urine creatinine kind of gave me in the urine osmolality. So I looked at the phenol. You said it was less than, uh, it was, it was 0.8%, so it's less than one. Mm -hmm. So suggest pre-renal, but again, you got to remember in true reality, it's not perfect. It could still be all of them. Uh, you look at the urine osmolality. If it's greater than 500, it does suggest kind of like you're really reabsorbing a lot of fluid and you're in a low flow state. So it does suggest pre-renal. It's not perfect. Look at the urinalysis. If there's any muddy brown casts, if there's any kind of white blood cell casts, urinia, cinephils, red blood cell casts, heavy proteinuria, that makes you start to be concerned for some type of intrarenal. Well, I don't see a lot of protein. I don't see a lot of red blood cells. I don't see a lot of white blood cells. And I only see hyaline casts. And hyaline casts is actually kind of a, refer to a low flow state. So it's actually whenever you're really dehydrated, the proteins that get filtered, they actually start kind of concentrating in the tubules and they bind together and make these hyaline casts. So it does support pre-renal. The other thing is I'm going to look at their history. So I look at the history and the volume status. And you told me off their kind of physical exam, I don't see any evidence of like super significant hypovolemia. Right. So I don't see features of like decreased skin turgor and dry mucous membranes. I do see features of hypotension and tachycardia, but that doesn't mean that they're hypovolemic. And then their history doesn't show any diarrhea, diuresis, burns, blood loss, anything like that. But I am worried. I don't see any history of heart failure. They don't look hypervolemic. I don't see any history of cirrhosis. They don't look hypervolemic. So it's unlikely CRS, HRS. And I don't even see any medications. I don't see any NSAIDs here, ACE inhibitors, ARBs. No. I do see an, actually, I, I lied. I do see an ACE inhibitor. So that is something to potentially consider like lisinopril. Oh, the lisinopril. Yeah, yeah. But again, I don't think it's going to cause them to be hypotensive, tachycardic, and have that profound jump in a creatinine. However, I'll still consider it. Um, and then the last thing is I see the hypotension, the tachycardia, the fever. And then I go down here, as you said, and I look at their white blood cell count, and I see 18,000. So I'm worried about septic shock. So I know it's a shock state. I don't think it's cardiogenic. I don't think it's hypovolemic. I don't think it's obstructive. I think this is septic shock. And with that being said, I think they have a pre-renal AKI at this point, secondary to septic shock. And I, and I would then be very, very concerned for this patient. If we don't treat this, get this kind of like figured out, they could progress. And sometimes that prolonged hypoperfusion can lead the patient to developing an intrarenal AKI like ATN. So that's what I would say for this is the likely diagnosis. So this is pretty concerning. We have to figure out our treatment approach quickly because like you said, <laughs> it's a septic shock state. So we have to figure out what do we do to treat this pre-renal AKI and more importantly, the septic shock. Are we just going to like nuke them with antibiotics? <laughs> yeah. So I definitely would. I'd start them on broad spectrum. We don't really know what kind of like sepsis is driving this. If it's from the lungs, if it's from the urinary tract, if it's from the abdomen, skin, whatever. Um, I would have to work them up for sepsis after this. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would do is I would start them on vancomycin, even though it is a little bit nephrotoxic. I got to be careful with that, but I got to cover my MRSA. Um, and then I would also put them on something to cover my gram negative and anaerobes. So I put them on like cefepime or piperacillin And so that'll give me a good coverage. Then I would start them on maybe a bolus of IV fluids, like 30 cc's per kg, get their tank a little filled up. And then after that, start them on vasopressors if their blood pressure is still low, because I got to perfuse their kidneys. So I got to yeah. treat the underlying cause. But while that antibiotics are kicking in, I need to perfuse those kidneys with fluids and vasopressors. So that's what I would do for this patient and just closely monitor their creatinine and see hopefully that the urine output will start to pick up as I push their blood pressure up, as I give them some more fluid, they'll respond properly. That's kind of the goal here. How about that potassium level? We haven't quite mentioned that yet. It is high. So what yeah. is, what's your concern there? I mean, at some point, this patient, you know, they're receiving antibiotics, vasopressors, but what complications are you thinking about in the back of your head? And let's say that that he does become pretty hyperkalemic, what do you do then? Yeah, so if I start them on this therapy and they don't start to turn around, I will really worry about a couple of different things. One, hyperkalemia. They already have a little bit, 6.2 is their level there. If that continues to rise, um, I might have to do something like a loop diuretic. I might have to add on like a potassium binding resin. And if they start having ECG changes, I may have to give them like calcium, insulin, albuterol combo. But I also have to start thinking if they don't respond to those things and they're getting really, really bad, I might have to consider dialysis. Um, the other thing is they're a little bit acidotic, 7.31, not terrible, but they're down there. Um, I would consider potentially if they're not getting any better, starting them on some bicarbonate, some, some sodium bicarbonate infusions. 
Um, and then the other thing is uh, I would watch out for hypervolemia. So as patients start to like shut down the renal function, they stop producing urine. As you get oligarch or anuric, you get super hypervolemic and you can get pulmonary edema, peripheral edema, weight gain. Um, you can get hypertension. You can get a lot of complications from that. So I'd watch out for that. The really big thing I also want to watch out for is uremia. So as the BUN starts climbing at 60, if it gets up towards 100, I worry about them developing like severe confusion, asterixis. I worry about pericarditis because that can cause pericardial effusions. And this patient was disoriented. Yeah. So that's yeah. a little concerning already. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, I would also worry about like uh, bleeding. So it can cause platelet dysfunction. So those are things that I'm going to watch out for. And if they aren't getting better, uh, I might have to put them on dialysis. But yeah, that's how I'd approach this one. Okay. Well, that's case one. <laughs> yeah, we knocked it out. Yeah, not right. too bad. All right. Well, we have case one wrapped up. However, just to make sure that we are constantly reviewing and making sure that we understand this, can we just get a quick recap of that one? Yeah, yeah. So patients definitely having features of an AKI based on the doubling of the creatinine and drop of the urine output. Check a renal bladder ultrasound always on every kind of workup. Rule out an obstruction. If you do, it's easy one to fix. If you do that and there's no evidence of obstruction, get your studies. So get your, you know, your phenol, get your urine osmolality, get your urinalysis, microscopy, do a good volume status exam and check out their history and physical. If you do that and their phenol, urine osmolality uh, suggests more potentially a pre-renal, look, look for heart failure, look for a cirrhosis and then evaluate them for hypervolemic states. If they look more hypovolemic, they have features that support volume loss, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, diuresis, dehydration, um, or even potentially um, some type of blood loss. Think about hypovolemia and look for that. And then lastly, if they have kind of a more potentially a very severe uh, hypotension state, think about shock, septic shock. Think about cardiogenic shock. Think about obstructive shock. But also don't rule out in this patient the medications, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, NSAIDs, Tacro. I may even discontinue their ACE inhibitor for a bit because they're hypotensive. I don't actually want to make them worse. Yeah. And plus, it's also going to increase their creatinine. So I would shut that off. So that's how I would work out that one. Intrarenal, if the phenol is greater than two, if the urine osmolality is low and their urinalysis suggests potential CAS, I am a little bit more concerned for intrarenal AKI. Think about muddy brown CAS, ATN. Look through their history. If I see potentially elevated urine eosinophils, white blood cell CAS, think about AIN, especially with the fever, triad, rash, and eosinophilia. And then for the glomerulonephritis, think about proteinuria and red blood cell CAS in the urine. And that would be concerning for that patient. So that's kind of how I would go about this. While you're treating the underlying cause, watch out for those complications, acidosis, hyperkalemia, hypervolemia, and uremia. Treat them medically, but if they don't get better, you may have to consider dialysis. Overall, when we're talking about acute kidney injury, is there one pre-intra post? Is there one that's more common than the others? Pre-renal is definitely the most common. Okay. So 60 to 70% of cases that you have when a patient comes to the hospital, most of the time it's pre-renal. Mm -hmm. Second most common is intrarenal, and the least common is post-renal. Post okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, with that being said, let's go ahead and move right into case two. So we have to discover the type of AKI. All right, we have a 72-year-old male presents to the ED with confusion and decreased urine output. Feels like I'm reading the same case again. Yeah, I think we are. But interestingly, something happens to this patient, I think. It's the same case. Yeah, but it's, it's something gets a little worse. Something gets a little worse. It gets a little spicy. He's going he's gonna to switch it up on us. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I, no, I, I had to make sure there. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm reading the same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, I screwed up. Appar <laughs> apparently not. All right. So the patient, a retired teacher, as we know, was initially in his usual state of health until three days ago when he began experiencing fever, chills, and increasing fatigue. Given these symptoms, he visited his primary care doc, who noted a significant increase in his creatinine from a baseline of 1.6 to 3.2. He recommended that he immediately go to the ED for further evaluation. Over the past 24 hours, his family noticed that he appeared confused and was not making as much urine as usual. He was subsequently admitted to the ICU for management of sub a suspected su uh, septic shock. Oh, mm. it's almost a little continuation here. It is. Okay. <laughs> Here, he experienced prolonged hypotension. The patient was also started on vancomycin and zosin for sepsis and underwent a contrast-enhanced CT scan to identify the source of sepsis. So past medical history, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and chronic kidney disease stage 2. Medications, as we talked about, metformin, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide. Exam, vitals, BP 80 over 35. Things are not getting better. <laughs> no, they're not. Why is his BP getting worse? <laughs> Heart rate is 120. Respiratory rate is 22. 
Temp 101.3 Fahrenheit and his O2 sat is 94% on room air. General elder, elderly, elderly male appears lethargic, disoriented. Cardio, tachycardic, peripheral pulses are weak, extremities are still cool to touch. He does have mild tachypnea, abdominal, soft, non-distended, mild, diffuse tenderness, skin purpuric rash on the lower extremities, and neurologic. Again, he is alert, but oriented to time and place. All right, Zach, so our patient was sent to the ICU and has gotten much worse. Yeah. So some, something didn't work with uh, case one here too well. No, it didn't. I mean, it looks like he originally had a pre-renal AKI, yeah. but things have definitely changed in the process. Things have changed. Things have, His blood pressure has gotten worse. Yep. So with this new information we're getting here, what's your differential at this point and what labs and imaging would you order to assess for the type of AKI in this patient? Yeah. So with this patient, this is the classic one. This is the one that I see a lot um, in the ICU as a patient comes into the ED. They're eventually kind of like a little hypotensive. Uh, they have maybe some underlying septic shock that's going on. They get started on these therapies. Maybe they get some imaging to further work up what's kind of going on and what's the cause of their sepsis. But eventually they get to the ICU and then maybe a day or two later, all of a sudden their renal function's worse. Mm -hmm. Everything's kind of going downhill. And the question is, is why? So my fear is that the patient is converted from a pre-renal AKI to an intrarenal AKI. Ugh. So I think that they've been prolonged, um, pro having consistent hypotension. They're not perfusing those kidneys. Problem is, is when you don't perfuse the kidneys, you don't get blood flow going through the glomerulus. If you guys can imagine with my mouth what I'm explaining, you don't get renal blood flow to the glomerulus and it doesn't leave the efferent arterial and then you don't get blood flow via the paratubular capillaries to the tubular cells. So if they don't get blood flow, those tubular cells start to die and necrose. When they do, that then converts them into what's called acute tubular necrosis. So acute tubular necrosis is, is the most common. 85 to 90% of intrarenal AKIs are ATN. Uh, and they're unlikely to be AIN and not as likely to be glomerulonephritis as well. So when we think about it, ATN is the most common. I think prolonged hypotension is a really, really big thing here. Also, we'll talk about this. Um, they got contrast, which they used to try to figure out in the CT scan what was the cause of the sepsis. Because they're trying to look for, is there something in the belly that's kind of going on or something in the lung somewhere else? And then on top of that, they got vancomycin. Vancomycin is a nephrotoxin. So I worry now that this patient has gotten vancomycin, which is a nephrotoxin, contrast, which is a nephrotoxin. Those can cause acute tubular necrosis. They've persistently been hypotensive despite treatment of their septic shock. That can cause acute tubular necrosis. So now I think that they have an intrarenal AKI. If I wanted to, I could reorder a lot of those tests um, for your boards. And we're going to do it here. You would. Yeah. In true clinical reality, you would just assume based upon the history and physical and everything that's happened that you wouldn't need to get these tests, but you still can. Uh, but I think it's unnecessary at this point. I would say history and physical suggests that at this point, the patient has started with septic shock with pre-renal, converted to intrarenal, and they likely have acute tubular necrosis. But I would still get a urinalysis. Um, I would get the uh, uh, urine sodium, urine osmolality, urine creatinine. Um, and again, I may even, if I'm concerned, did something happen in the process, I may even get a renal bladder ultrasound, but I don't think it's necessary. Well, here at Ninjaneer, we're, we're thorough. <laughs> we're very thorough. We're going to make sure we work this patient up correctly. And, Let's do it. And get them all fixed up. Let's do it. So we get lab findings back. It's going to be a lot of the same ones we've talked about prior. The phenol is now 2.5%. Urine osmolality, 280. Protein, trace. Red blood cell, 2 to 3 per high power field. White blood cell, 1 to 2 per high power field. Cas, we now have presence of muddy brown cas. Creatinine, it was previously 3.2. So originally 1.6 to 3.2. <laughs> now we're at 4.8. Yeah, they're going downhill, man. <laughs> this is going downhill quickly in yep. a bad way. Yep. BUN, 102. Sodium, 135. Potassium is 6.8. ABG, we get that back. pH is now 7.21. Bicarb is 11. And PCO2 is 26. Sounds like a metabolic acidosis. Yeah, it's getting worse. Yep. We get a CBC. Our white count is now 28,000. Yeah. This person's oh, sick this, as this can be. poor patient. Yep. Hemoglobin, 10.8, and a platelet count of 250,000. Imaging findings, we do get the renal and, uh, and bladder ultrasound again. Exact same thing that showed before. There's no obstructions. So given the HMP, these labs, imaging, 
Zach, what is your likely diagnosis? So again, I don't think that in a true clinical reality, we would have needed a lot of these labs. You could have gotten a urinalysis if you need to. And I would check, just look for these complications as well. Um, but I would say the FENA, now that it's converted and it's greater than 2%, it suggests an intrarenal AKI. The urinalysis is less than 350, suggests potentially an intrarenal AKI. Look at the protein, trace. So there's not a heavy protein urea, unlikely glomerulonephritis. Red blood cells, it's not heavy, so they don't have a lot of red blood cells that are present in the urine, like hematuria. White blood cells, not a ton in the urine, so it's unlikely to have any white blood cells that are heavy amount like urine eosinophils. And then the cast, there isn't uh, you know, any kind of like uh, red blood cell cast. There isn't any evidence of white blood cell cast or urine eosinophils. It's muddy brown cast. That's pathognomonic for ATN. Creatinine, worsened. BUN, worsened. Potassium, worsened. Acid-based status, worsened. And then their leukocytosis, worsened. So they're getting worsening renal function, worsening complications, and then their sepsis is getting worse. So I think that this is likely intrarenal AKI, ATN is the cause, and it's due to prolonged hypotension in the setting of septic shock, plus nephrotoxic use, contrast, vancomycin. That's what I would say is the likely trigger here. The the treatment, we're, it's not cutting it here. Things are going downhill. Yeah, we're, we're, The approach we have is not correct. No. How do we help this patient out? How do we get him back to normal? Yeah, I I would reach out to nephrology right away. Okay, <laughs> I'd say help me, help me. <laughs> but oftentimes in the interim, and they might even support this as well. You're gonna try. So obviously, there was a lot of studies done on looking at early dialysis in patients who have some type of trigger for like a significant acute kidney injury, and they found that there was no true difference in like and functional outcomes between those who started dialysis early and those who started a little bit late. Um, and so with that being said, you have to be careful. You want to start dialysis if you need to. But if you can try to potentially prevent that, it's always a nice thing. So I would try to treat some of these complications medically first. And then I would still reach out to my nephrology team. So they have a metabolic acidosis. Uremic acidosis is one type of acidosis that responds to bicarbonate. I would start them on a sodium bicarbonate infusion. Um, the next thing is they have hyperkalemia. I would try. I don't know if they're going to respond but I'm going to give them a heavy dose of a loop diuretic. And maybe I might even give them like a potassium binding resin, like sodium polystyrene sulfonate or maybe pateroma of some sort. And then look to see if that can help to excrete the phosphate. Uh, I'm sorry, the potassium in the stool and then excrete the potassium into the urine. And if they had EKG changes, I would give them that calcium insulin albuterol combo. If they were hypervolemic, which this patient really isn't, I would give them a heavy dose of a loop diuretic. Uh, the one thing I'm concerned about is they have really bad BUN. It's like 102. Yeah. They're confused. I'm kind of concerned. I would really start to push this patient for initiation of dialysis, but I would try my best to see if I can get them to improve with the metabolic acidosis and the hyperkalemia. And if they don't get better and the uremia is starting to get worse, I would call my nephrology team, obtain a central venous catheter in there, and then start them on hemodialysis for this patient. But I think that's it. I think we're going to hopefully um, get them on hemodialysis eventually. I think it's going to come to that no matter what. After you dialyze them, I do suspect that the renal function will improve. You'll allow for those antibiotics to start kicking in, killing off that bacteria that's causing this. And I do think over a process of months, or you might gain some renal function back in the recover. Well, it's not listed here, but I'm going to give a, the case a happy ending. <laughs> Patient went home healthy, happy. <laughs> Went back to fishing and golfing. There you go. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and move on then to actually before we move on, do you want to give any quick recap? Is there anything that you really want to harp on here? I would just again, I would be very cognizant of whenever you're looking at a patient with an AKI, it's always good to get these like urinalyses and get the phenos and stuff like that. But I always would say the history and the physical exam and a good volume status will give you a lot of the information that you need. And it might be better than looking at these adjunctive tests. I think they're good to get and you can get them, but just don't have all your energy focus on, oh, this is an intrarenal or prerenal AKI based upon the phenos and the urine osmolalities and the BU and creatinine ratio. Those are great. And I think they can be utilized as an adjunct to a really good history, physical exam and a volume status. So maybe just like really have the reasoning for why you're getting the test yep. and, and make sure you're choosing the right ones. Exactly. You don't have to shotgun approach. Exactly. It. Because this patient, I could have gotten all those things, but I didn't really need to because I think their history, physical and everything else and their whole course made so much sense as to why this was happening. But I think that's a really big thing and something that clinically is applicable. The stuff that we did is more truly, I think, board perfect. Cool. But clinically not as perfect. 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and move into case three then. We have to, again, discover the type of AKI. There's only one one left, so <laughs> yeah. you could probably what guess could it. What could it be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go through it and let's figure this out and really learn from this case. Last one. We have a 76-year-old male presents with lower abdominal discomfort and a decrease in urine output. The patient reports that over the past week, he has experienced increasing difficulty initiating urination and a sensation of an incomplete bladder emptying. He also notes increased urinary frequency and nocturia. Over the last 48 hours, he has felt mild lower abdominal discomfort and noticed that his urine output has significantly decreased. Sounds like my dad. <laughs> Hopefully he's not watching this. Poor Bobo. <laughs> Let's hope he's not watching this. He's like, dang it, Robbie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the patient has not experienced any fever, chills, or flank pain. Okay. Past medical history, benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, yeah, yeah. type 2 diabetes. Uh, let's see here. Hypertension, depression. Medications is tamsulosin, finasteride, metformin, lisinopril, and then sertraline. For his exam, we have vitals. BP is 145 over 85. Heart rate is 78. Respiratory rate is 16 and his temp is 98.1. General, we have an elderly male in no acute distress. Cardio, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs. Respiratory is clear to auscultation bilaterally. Abdominal, mild suprapubic tenderness, no rebounding, no guarding. Neurologic is alert and oriented, no focal deficits. And genitourinary, enlarged. Uh. Firm. Right there, fucking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, no. Enlarged, firm, non tender <laughs> prostate on digital rectal exam. Hello. <laughs> All right, Zach. So, our new patient has what seems to be of an evidence of an AKI. Yeah. Mm, I would think so. Yeah. What's your differential at this point? What labs, what imaging are you getting for this patient? All right. So, I think this is post renal, and obviously, this is the last case. So, it's post renal. <laughs> but, um, for this patient, I think their history suggests it. So even if we didn't know, I think that their evidence of what's called, I would say, overflowing continence in the setting of a bladder outlet obstruction like BPH is likely their cause. Um, because if you have that bladder outlet obstruction, you're not able to get urine out. And so they'll have that sensation of where they feel like they have to go, but they just can't. Um, and so that's classic. They also don't have any like flank pain. And so it also makes me think less about potentially like a nephrolithiasis of sorts. Um, so what I would do is I would say this is likely post renal AKI. What you could do is get a renal bladder ultrasound for thoroughness just to make sure that you don't miss something like a mass in the abdomen or like bilateral nephrolithiasis and look to see if that's the case. I would do that first. I would also, I mean, again, I would check a BMP, look at their creatinine, look at their potassium, look at some of the other electrolytes and make sure that those aren't disarrayed um, and maybe even look at their, their acid base status as well, potentially. But I would say a renal bladder ultrasound is going to give me a lot of love um, and then potentially even accessing a post void residual is going to give me a lot of love there yeah. too. So I'd say that'd be the biggest thing to start off with. Um, yeah. Hit me with if, if you got those. I, we do. We get them back. We got some <laughs> imaging here. We got some labs. So we get the BMP, we get the, C, uh, the CBC. So we have a creatinine of 2.9. It has increased from the baseline of 1.4. BUN is 50. Sodium is 138. Potassium is 4.8. And the CBC is within norms. Imaging, we get a, a renal bladder ultrasound. We note bilateral hydronephrosis and a distended bladder with thickened walls. No visible kidney stones or masses are present. So Zach, given the HMP, the labs, the imaging, we pretty much have a pretty solid concrete diagnosis. Yeah, I think this one's a pretty easy one. It's a slam dunk, and that's why post renals you can't, you don't want to miss them because they're kind no. of pretty easy. I yeah, mean, you know, when yeah. you think about it, and they're they're easy to fix. Um, and so for this one, they got a renal bladder ultrasound that shows bilateral hydro. Um, they got a distended bladder, so it's likely at the distal obstruction. So it's likely at the bladder outlet or at the bladder level. Um, because if it was above that, like a proximal, you would see maybe a stone or a mass that was obstructing the ureter or around the ureter, and they would get backflow and they get hydroureter, hydronephrosis. And maybe if it's bilateral, they probably have like a normal size bladder or an empty bladder. But in this case, it's 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 gargantuan. It's like a melon. So if they have that, um, plus the history of BPH, I think this is post renal AKI, secondary to BPH. You can get a neurogenic bladder. Um, they were on citrulline. 
So citrulline has some anticholinergic properties. Um, any kind of SSRI actually does contain some degree of anticholinergic properties, so they may affect the detrusor muscle contraction. Mm -hmm. um, and so is there a possibility of that? Yeah, but I would go the route of saying, I think this is BPH. Let me treat that and then evaluate, do I need to consider discontinuing or decreasing their citrulline? But I don't think that's the likely culprit. So at this point, this patient's melon of a prostate is <laughs> blocking urine out, outflow. <laughs> How do we fix this? How do we help the prostate? How do we really tone down this BPH to allow the patient to, you know, void and, and have a better quality of life? Are we just going to hit him with a terp? <laughs> <laughs> I think potentially at the end, end goal. So I would look at this in the sense of how do I improve their kidney injury, right? And so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decompress the bladder, decompress the ureter, decompress the um, the kidneys. And so by doing that, I'm going to place a Foley catheter. And so I'm going to put it past the obstruction. And so if I put a Foley catheter in to go through the urethra, past the prostate and into the bladder, I'll literally start yanking urine from their bladder, from their ureter, from their kidneys out and I'll help to relieve that obstruction and improve their GFR and outflow of urine. And so I would expect their AKI to improve not too long after I put the Foley in. Long-term control of the BPH is dependent upon this person. They're already on Tamsulosin and they're already on, I think it was a finasteride. So they've reached kind of like close to their maximal medical therapy. I probably would refer this patient for a, a TERP. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. So then they would go to urology and hopefully, you know, they would maybe get a TERP to Yep, and I think after that, that, and that would help with all, not only with reducing their incidences of complications like AKI, right. urinary tract infections as well from urine retention, but also improve their quality of life and their symptoms as well. And so, yeah, I think that that would be good, and I think our patient would have a very easy, good, and quick outcome that would be beneficial for them. Okay, cool. Well, we've discussed a lot of information in this episode, Zach. If you could, can you give just, maybe you don't feel up to it, I don't know. <laughs> You can say no if you want. I'll do anything for you, Robbo. What do you need, buddy? A quick summary of a pre-intra post. Just the most important things, especially for you know people who are studying this that need to try and differentiate. Absolutely. So big thing, start off, look at their creatinine. Has it greater than or, greater than or equal to 0.3 milligram increase in twenty a uh, two-day period? Have they had a greater than or equal to 1.5 times their baseline in seven days? Or have they had oliguria, so less than 0.5 cc's per kilogram per hour and greater than or equal to six hours? If they had, then it's likely an AKI. From there, rule out post-renal. Get your renal bladder ultrasound. Do a good physical and history. If you do that, it shows hydronephrosis, hydroureter. Then from there, you're thinking about an obstruction. From there, look at the actual history. For example, if I look at the bladder and the bladder is kind of normal, decompressed, they have flank pain, they have hematuria, they have nausea, vomiting. Think about bilateral nephrolithiasis. If they don't have that and their bladder is like the size of a melon and they have a history of BPH, they have a history of neurogenic bladder, then I would go the route of it being a distal obstruction. Okay. From there, put the Foley in. You'll likely improve it. If it's nephro, you're probably going to need to refer to urology for a stent or some type of percutaneous nephrostomy. If you've ruled out no obstruction, you come down, is it pre or intra? From there, look at your history and physical and volume status and your urinalysis more often than not. But get your phenol and get your urine osmolality and look at the BU and creatinine ratio. If the phenol is less than one, if the urine osmolality is greater than 500, if the BU and creatinine ratio is greater than like 20 to one, then you can think about pre-renal, but it's not perfect. It still could be all the other ones. From there, look at the urinalysis. If there's no muddy brown cast, no white cell cast, no urine eosinophils, no red blood cell cast, it's unlikely to be some type of intrarenal process. And if they have hyaline cast, it adds to the support of pre-renal. But look at the history and physical. Cirrhosis. CHF, hypervolemic, could be CRS or HRS. Do they have ACE inhibitors, ARBs, NSAIDs, TACRO, uh, any kind of like use of nephrotoxic drugs? Discontinue them if able and reevaluate. If they look like they're hypovolemic, decreased skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, they have hypotension, tachycardia, and they have evidence of losses of volume, think about hypovolemia, give them fluid. And if they're hypotensive and really hypotensive with multi-system organ dysfunction, Support their blood pressure, give them fluids, give them vasopressors, treat the underlying cause of their shock, and it should improve. If they have a phenol that's greater than 2%, urine osmolality that's low, less than 350, and then on top of that, you think that their urinalysis is supportive of CAS, think about intrarenal AKI. If the intrarenal AKI has a suggestive muddy brown CAS, think about ATN. Look if they have prolonged hypotension. Look for nephrotoxins. If they have white blood cell CAS with urine eosinophils, fever, rash, and eosinophiluria, Think potentially about AIN. Look for any medications. 
beta lactams, NSAIDs, PPIs, et cetera. And then lastly, if they have lots of proteinuria, if they have lots of hematuria with red blood cell casts, think about glomerulonephritis. At the end of all of this with a patient with AKI, be careful. As you monitor them, the biggest thing that you're trying to ask yourself is, do they need dialysis? If they have refractory acidosis, refractory to sodium bicarbonate, if they have hyperkalemia, refractory to medical management, if they have hypervolemia, refractively to loop diuretics, or if they have uremic encephalopathy, uremic pericarditis, or uremic bleeding-related complications for platelet dysfunction, you need to initiate this patient on hemodialysis. So that's the way I would look, diagnose, and treat a patient with AKI. All right. Well, unfortunately, the fun has to stop at some point. <laughs> We've wrapped up our episode here on acute kidney injury. I'm going to be taking Zach. He's going to be helping me paint my garage. <laughs> so we've got to get out of here. I'm going to also force my wife, Kristen. She's going to be doing a lot of painting. <laughs> Maybe I'll just watch him, right? Let's have a day, my friend. Let's have a day. <laughs> so we'll get some painting done, but uh, don't worry. I'm going to have to help him out too. <laughs> yeah, it never ends. The days never end. But thank you guys for listening to this podcast. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I hope it made sense. I hope at the end of this that you would be able to go on to any kind of ward and say, I know what to do to manage or at least figure out this AKI. So I hope at the end of this, you enjoyed it and learned a lot and uh, love you. Thank you. And as always, until next time.